I'd like to thank uh, all of you for organizing this uh, really fascinating conference. So <clears throat> I'd like to start with an analogy, right? So in states of matter, you have uh, microscopic interactions, right? The change, right? Differences in the coupling, the interactions lead to an emergence of differences in uh, the macroscopic behavior of matter, right? So if you have increased interactions, you're more likely to get ice, water, whereas a higher entropy state of the microscopic system will lead to, to gas. So similarly, we have a, a problem like this in uh, brain states is how to connect the, the scales in some kind of coherent, formal way. Um, and as uh, a few people have pointed out today, uh, we, we noticed that uh, there seems to be something conserved. When the signals are uh, large, they're also simple, uh, such as in slow wave sleep, uh, whereas when the signals are small, they're complex. And so we wondered uh, first if there was a way to, to quantify this, um, and then what were the mechanisms or you know, some of the maybe microscopic features that were related, and then also what it could possibly mean for brain function. You know, is it epiphenomenal? Is it interesting? Maybe we'll know someday. <laughs> So uh, I offer three hypotheses here. The first is that macroscopic signal complexity and magnitude vary together with brain state. Uh, second hypothesis is that changes in neural interactions may relate intuitively to macroscopic spectral changes. And a third hypothesis is that spontaneous behavior of the system modulates its responsiveness to perturbations. So historically, the way that we've studied uh, these macroscopic brain signals is by looking at the power spectra. Um, and then uh, people chop these up into, you know, into this is delta, this is theta, this is alpha. Um, and in fact, you can see shifts in the power between the bands. How people draw the bands uh, depends on the study. Um, and uh, I found it very confusing, uh, this literature, um, but very important to understand because uh, the desynchronization of brain signals is one of the strongest correlates of consciousness. So, so is there something uh, useful about this? So one of the first things I did uh, was to look at magnetoencephalography data from humans uh, and just plot the power spectra from very short epochs of time rather than taking a long time period because uh, hopefully what the brain is doing uh, changes regularly. <laughs> and, uh, and to only take the power spectra from individual people, uh, from individual sensors, because uh, I think you lose maybe a lot of the information in the averages. And if you can find something where the, the dimensionality kind of falls out by itself, I, I think it's more meaningful and more interesting. So from each sensor, each person, each epoch, um, <clears throat> I looked at the power spectra. And in those power spectra, instead of uh, you know, uh, drawing bands, I just identified the local maxima and then plotting the probability distribution of those local maxima for all of the subjects to say, is there a place logically I can draw the bands? Is there a, you know, like where probability drops to zero, that should be, you know, the difference between alpha and beta, for example. And uh, there's no obvious place to draw the band. And beyond that, uh, you know, if you're looking for, for example, power in alpha, <clears throat> you could see a difference uh, in that alpha power because actually there is uh, a particular change in alpha power, or because there's a broadband shift, um, and if the brain is behaving as you know coupled uh, oscillators might, um, you might see shifts in the frequency domain. So uh, another way is just to have a shift in the offset um, or a shift in the slope, right? And any of these things could be interpreted as a change in the alpha power, and uh, and so. There are some tools that are coming out, for example, uh, for parameterizing neural power spectra, which are really interesting. Um, <clears throat> and so what, what I suggested um, was that we could perhaps quantify this in terms of the energy and the entropy. So instead of drawing uh, bands uh, you know, at predefined locations, just draw bands at the resolution of the data, which here is 0.5 hertz. So each 0.5 hertz in the power spectra, we drew a band. Now, uh, what we did <clears throat> was to uh, just define uh, the area under the, the power spectrum, just the integral, and to find this as a spectral energy. 
Um, and to take the, uh, the probability distribution, so to normalize um, the power spectrum as a probability distribution, right, to, uh, to obtain a spectral entropy. So what this uh, spectral entropy is uh, like a dispersion of the frequencies, uh, a dispersion of the entropy in the frequency domain. So uh, <clears throat> what you can see is a signal. Uh, first, we were looking at uh, the same subjects um, in a resting state um, or performing an NBAC uh, working memory task. So just to uh, have different levels of activation. And uh, so you can see, first of all, that uh, the power spectrum, even from each epoch, is changing a lot, right? So, but bef between states, uh, there tends to be a shift to the lower power um, when the subject is more resting, right? Whereas the power spectrum tends to flatten out when the subject is, uh, is more active. And so if we quantify this, uh, this is data just from one subject. Each point is uh, an epoch, a sensor epoch, right? And you can see for, for each uh, subject, right, uh, there is a, there's a relationship between the spectral entropy and the spectral energy that's defined, where during the resting state, the energy of the signal is higher and the entropy is lower. Uh, whereas in the, the more activated states, the spectral energy is lower, whereas the spectral entropy is higher. So when the person is active, the signal is smaller and more complex. Um, we wondered, could this be like a tautological relationship that we've defined somehow? So um, what, what Trung Yan helped a lot in doing is, uh, is shuffling. <laughs> so first we shuffled the, uh, the spectra, right? Just to uh, conserve the same energy, but to change the entropy of the signal, right? So you can see that you can change the entropy without changing the energy of the signal. Whereas you can just shift the, the same shape of the power spectrum up uh, thereby increasing the energy without changing uh, the entropy. So as far as we can tell, these are not tautological. If you have other ways that we can try to disprove the theory, uh, I'm very happy to hear, um, because I've never seen human data behave so well. Um, so in essence, each of these points is a mean uh, for, for one subject. So since this is one subject, you take the mean of all the points and you get one point. So this is... Uh, 70 subjects. And you can see that um, in the active state, the entropy is generally higher. Uh, whereas uh, the, the, so in the active state, the entropy is higher, whereas the energy is lower. Now, is this uh, just uh, unique to magnetoencephalography? Uh, the answer is no. We can see uh, this strong relationship between the, the effective energy and the effective entropy also in, uh, in EEG. So signal complexity and magnitude seem to vary together with brain state. Um, if you take a system of coupled oscillators, this is a Kuramoto model, and you find the critical region. Of course, if the oscillators are completely uncoupled or completely coupled, uh, the behavior is not really interesting. But there's a critical region where the, the oscillators are coupled, um, but, but not so much to be completely entrained together. And what you can see is uh, in, this, uh, in this critical region, um, the the, uh, the more the, the oscillators are coupled together, the higher is the spectral energy and the lower is the, uh, is the spectral entropy. So we can, we can um, attribute possibly uh, these changes in the effective energy and entropy to changes in uh, coupling of the system's components. <clears throat> so changes in neural interactions could cause macroscopic spectral shifts. But what would it mean for the brain to be more or less coupled? Um, what would be the biological mechanisms underlying changes in such coupling? So uh, you, can, you can see uh, more about this story in this preprint that we've published uh, with Chang'an and Alain and uh, Cristiano as well, uh, and, and me. So uh, one of the changes, uh, as we've discussed today, uh, between uh, more and less active states is the level of neuromodulation in the brain. So uh, if you have higher levels of neuromodulation, you do things like uh, close potassium leak channels and thereby depolarize neurons um, and, and shut off spike frequency adaptation, All right? So when you have uh, the leak channels open with low modulation, you have up and down states uh, that dis disappear when you close these leak channels, depolarizing the cells leading to a fluctuation driven regime. 
So um, <clears throat> we started working on building a multi-scale model. Um, essentially, uh, they're adx neurons, right? They're networks of adx uh, neurons. Um, and transfer functions have been developed semi-analytically. You, uh, you can ask Cristiano and Matteo Di Volo a lot about the details. They love this subject. Um, so you can define the mean essentially from the excitatory and inhib inhibitory populations. And from these mean fields, you can use data like a human connectome to, to connect them together. Right, where each brain region is uh, represented by one mean field model, um, and the delays are determined by the uh, by the lengths of the um, uh, distances between uh, mean fields in the diffusion uh, magneto MRI. <laughs> so, here, uh, what we find is by changing the spike frequency adaptation. You go from this uh, very asynchronous state uh, to a state where you have uh, slow waves. So the macroscopic signal complexity and magnitude vary together with brain states and changes in neural interactions can cause macroscopic spectral changes. Uh, how are we doing on time? I see. I want to show you very quickly uh, this tool that uh, we've released uh, now. It should be public uh, very, very soon uh, for the Human Brain Project. It was one of the showcases where uh, essentially you can run these models by yourself. So you have the excitatory inhibitory populations that represent each of the nodes um, that are connected together here by the uh, by human connectome. But uh, we've now developed this for mouse and macaque as well. Um, and you can put the model either into synchronous states and you can see the different regions uh, being more or less uh, synchronous. You can look at the histograms, uh, the power spectra, you see an emergence of you know, what is about a delta peak. You can look at the, the pairwise correlations between the regions, et cetera. Um, or you can change the spike frequency adaptation to lower values uh, to get more asynchronous regimes. Um, Another thing that we did was to reproduce this perturbational complexity index. So uh, we've run the model several times uh, to have uh, enough realizations for statistics. And uh, in fact, that will bring me back to my slides. So if we, uh, using this TVB addX model, uh, change the adaptation strength, uh, we can reproduce this relationship between the energy and the entropy. So it looks like uh, changes in, uh, in the biophysical mechanisms that are related to differences in neuromodulation uh, can, uh, can account for uh, the differences in the spectral energy and entropy, this, change, uh, this correlated change in the complexity and the amplitude of the signal. So <clears throat> coming back to uh, the metaphor, right? So depending on uh, the state of the matter that you perturb, uh, whether it's a still pond of water or uh, something with laminar flow or turbulence, um, the, the, the perturbation will, will propagate in different ways, right? And uh, to me, this is the essence of the perturbational complexity index. Right where um, where TMS uh, is applied and uh, the signals are measured with EEG, and essentially, uh, when subjects are awake and active, you see a much uh, further propagation of the signals, both in time and space. Whereas when subjects are unconscious, you see a much more localized response. Even if the uh, even if the initial response is higher in amplitude, um, the perturbations do not propagate so far in space or time. And so you can quantify this uh, with the perturbational complexity index, which you've been introduced to. Um, so finally here, uh, we've reproduced this data using the TVB addX model, <clears throat> where you can see that the perturbational complexity uh, values are much higher in the, the less synchronous, the more asynchronous regimes. And in the more synchronous regimes, the PCI is lower. Uh, and if you visualize this, uh, uh, here replicating uh, some of the work uh, done by uh, Simone and uh, Marcello um, and uh, their wonderful co 
collaborators. Um, so if we perturb the right premotor cortex, we see uh, an extensive perturbation of the uh, uh, extensive propagation of the perturbation uh, in time and space. Whereas in the synchronous regime, <clears throat> there's a much more uh, localized response in time and space. And I think this is, a, this is really interesting to come back to the issue of coupling, right? Because uh, there's, there seems to be a debate in the literature about whether the brain is more or less coupled in sleep. And I think the answer is both, right? It depends on your definition of coupling. So if, uh, if we're talking about phase coupling or Kuramoto type coupling, um, then it seems like uh, the networks may be more coupled, right? But since they're so entrained together that any perturbation will not be transferred. So in the sense of coupling as transfer entropy or uh, transmission of information or however you measure the communication between regions, this type of coupling is actually reduced in the unconscious brain. All right, and uh, this has led to um, another preprint. So uh, hopefully we'll have both of these published really soon. So um, <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, in conscious compared to unconscious or activated versus less activated brain states, macroscopically increased spectral entropy and decreased energy can be phenomenologically explained by decreased overall coupling between the system's components. Biophysically, spike frequency adaptation regulated by neuromodulation can account for changes in Kuramoto type coupling. And this type of coupling and entrainment in the neural networks uh, in less active brain states leads to larger responses uh, that don't propagate in time and space. And somehow the neural codes may rely on this complexity of brain states to encode information. And so this is one of the reasons I was asking about, you know, are our synchronous states uh, more energetically favorable somehow? Um, because it seems to be like the default state of the brain. Um, <clears throat> and so if it's the default state of the brain, then maybe what we're, we're measuring as our effective energy is something like a free energy, energy that's available to the system, right? <clears throat> and so then the question would arise, why would the brain actually go into this, uh, this highly complex state, this kind of gas-like state? And uh, I think the answer could be because then you could have um, localized kind of crystallization events, right? That would, that would differentiate from the background dynamics. And so, I think this speaks to another uh, paradox, which is that synchrony seems to be important for consciousness, right? When, when networks are coding, they tend to synchronize. And yet uh, the brain is most synchronous when it's unconscious, right? And so if you, if you think that perhaps it's the difference in entropy, right? Because a synchronous state is, a, is very low entropy. So if you go from a high entropy state to a synchronized state, that reduces the dimensionality. It reduces the entropy and actually uh, could be a definition of information that, the, that might be relevant to the brain. So uh, yeah, we've uh, started to, to quantify these, uh, these collapses in uh, entropy in, uh, <clears throat> in the TVB ADEX model uh, upon perturbation. And uh, a, a nice, um, a nice uh, kind of, uh, bonus of this collapse in the entropy is that you have an increase in the energy locally. Um, and so uh, we start to wonder if that could be related to uh, what is being seen as like a ignition uh, of, of particular networks. So um, yeah, with that, I'm out of time. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, some brilliant PhD students who worked with me on this project, including Chang'an, Lionel, Bahar, uh, a postdoc named Damien, who worked between uh, Victor and Alain's lab, and uh, in particular, Victor and Alain for all of their kind mentorship and support. And uh, thank you.